welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. I'm Manoj Kewalramani and today I have with me my colleague Anushka Saxena and we'll be talking about Liang Hue. Now, if you're wondering what that is, those are the two sessions that take place in China every year in the beginning of March. And these are really important. This is sort of the annual parliamentary sessions, but there's lots of stuff that happens and we'll try and get into the meat of the matter. There's lots of data that comes out, which is really, really useful because it gives you indications of what's happening in the Chinese policy domain for the year, what's the policy agenda for the year. So Anushka, firstly, welcome to this conversation. Thank you, Manoj. Happy to be here. So let's begin with sort of the basics, right? What exactly are the two sessions and which are these two entities that are meeting, if you could explain to us? Right. So just in uh, brief, as you mentioned, these are the Liang Hue and what the two sessions entails are the annual meetings of the National People's Congress or the NPC, which is China's legislature and the top political advisory body, which is the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference or CPPCC. And their collective meetings are known as the two sessions. And this event began on the 4th of March and uh, more than 2,000 members of the CPPC and the NPC assemble at the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. And there are about 3,000 deputies in the legislature that represent provinces across China, autonomous regions like Hong Kong and Macau, municipalities, and there is a delegation from the People's Liberation Army and the People's Armed Police, which are mainly represented in the provincial delegations. And there is a Taiwanese delegation as well, and it's mostly represented by political elites from the mainland. And the CPPC in specific debates proposals and doesn't necessarily pass any laws. And it consists of, again, about 2,100, 2,200 representatives from various representative groups, industries, and even members from the non-communist political parties. And these sessions are supposed to last for two weeks. And uh, what we're going to see and what is going to be of importance is the set of new appointments to key government legislative and advisory roles and the announcements of institutional reform plans, what the policy proposals for the year to come are going to look like. We also see uh, Li Keqiang, the outgoing uh, Chinese premier, present a work report for what was achieved in the past few months and years. And uh, there was also a proposal for a draft uh, central and local budget for 2023, which was accompanied with the report on the execution of the central and local budgets for 2022. And these are sort of the varied set of documents and proposals that will be debated across the two weeks. Key appointments will be undertaken. And ultimately, at the end of the two weeks, we will see what the Chinese uh, political, social and economic structure is going to look like and what to expect from domestic, economic and foreign policy in the years to come. That sounds really great. And that's a fantastic explanation of everything that's going on. I I have a very sort of, uh, you know, often people ask this question. And if you read the reports that are going to come out uh, and that have already started coming out over the last couple of days on these two sessions, the one term that you will repeatedly see being used is rubber stamp parliament, right? So if there is so much debate and discussion happening, why is it a rubber stamp parliament? I think the idea that China has a rubber stamp parliament has more to do with the perception that it's kind of a political metaphor, which means that the institution itself might have de jure power, but little de facto power, which would mean that um, even though the institution has the uh, authority to debate laws and proposals, it's necessarily being controlled and overseen by uh, the helmsman, which is Xi Jinping in this case. And therefore, anything that they debate upon or anything that becomes passed or comes into force as a result of these deliberations will be kind of influenced and overshadowed by 
the whims and fancies of Xi Jinping and his Politburo Standing Committee. And so uh, this largely has to do with the kind of global perception uh, that we have on Chinese politics and uh, might not nece- necessarily be the case in China because the policy proposals that are debated in the NPC or the CPPCC essentially form the basis of what observers and uh, policymakers should expect, what local government should expect the targets would look like in the months and years to come. And so while it might be kind of an inflated narrative that this is just a rubber stamp parliament, that is necessarily not the case. And even though, yes, there is a lot of power vested in Xi Jinping, he needs a set of talented and skilled deliberators and delegates that can essentially inform him of challenges the country is facing as a whole. And that kind of informed debate ultimately influences policy. So yes, there may be a kernel to, of truth to it being a rubber stamp parliament, but at the same time, the deliberations undertaken therein should not be underestimated and will not be underestimated by Xi Jinping or the Politburo Standing Committee in any way. Yeah, see, this is the fascinating thing about, you know, doing some of these conversations within Takshashila is that uh, we can see that we have differences of opinion uh, in how we view something. I mean, I I sort of partly agree with what you're saying and I partly disagree. I I think that there is more than a kernel of truth to it. I think there's a full bag full of truth to it. And this is evident in the fact that, say, at present, uh, this particular two sessions is supposed to approve and authorize the party state institutional change plan, the reform plan for institutional change in the party and the state. And this plan was discussed at the party's second plenary session in late February. It was then submitted. The submission also included key appointments, which were authorized and approved by the party central committee during uh, during its second plenary session. And the NPC is not going to really make any changes to this plan. Uh, you're not going to see any questioning of the appointments. You're not going to see votings on this voting on this plan, which is going to say demonstrate significant opposition. And that's historically been the case. You rarely see things which are being presented being voted down, which is, I guess, you know, the fact that why you would see this as a rubber rubber stamp parliament. I said, yes, there is tremendous pageantry and there is all of that. But like you said, you know, there is at the end of the day, no essential authority to contradict or to genuinely deliberate and to genuinely sort of push back on what may have been proposed and what may have been tabled. On the other hand, I do agree with you that there is, I think, a significant discussion that takes place. And that discussion is essentially about how do you implement what has already been outlined? It's rarely about, you know, what the priorities should be, which, for example, parliaments around the world, including the Indian parliament, will be discussing what should be the structure of laws, how should they be changed, and whether one needs said law or doesn't need said law. That is what doesn't happen in the Chinese system. You will see essentially a lot of nodding and in agreement with whatever has been proposed by the party. And the fact that this current institutional reform plan that is being proposed, and we'll get into some of the details, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that also, essentially something that has been agreed upon and is essentially something that at least if the previous institutional reform plan of 2018 is something to go by, indicates that you're going to see much more party control over state organs. Uh, Tells you that the legislature doesn't really, you know, does anything significant. Is there consultation on on certain issues? Are there inputs sought on things? Are there inputs sought on how to refine some things? Yes. But is there that, you know, genuine pushback, discussion, disagreement? Not really, right? Uh, at least not at all in public. So, so yeah, I sort of agree with the fact that yes, there is it's worth following the discussion and deliberation because it gives you some degree of sense of the political winds uh, and the legislative agenda. But on the other hand, it is a, for all purposes a rubber stamp parliament. It doesn't necessarily contradict or put a spanner in the works at all of the system, right? So would you agree with that categorization? Right. Uh, I think you've convinced me that there is indeed a uh, bags of truth to this. The idea of doing away this collective form of leadership and how it has resulted in the separation of the party and the state is indeed a trend that is, that is 
clearly visible under Xi Jinping. And this explains why there is an uh, emphasis on the leadership becoming centralized and unified under Xi. And the more the party and the state become virtually indistinguishable, the easier it has become for Xi to become the core of Chinese politics and for the CPC to become like the sole legitimate governing institution of the country. And so if 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 the CPC with Xi at its core is the primary institution to look up to, then institutional reform indeed doesn't really mean uh, substantively as much as it means in terms of narrative. And to to this end, I do agree that we've seen Xi Jinping increasingly sideline some of the roles members of the state council or the NPC may have. We see Li Keqiang sidelined and we see Xi rapidly taking over economic profiles which were conventionally managed by the premier since 2013. And these these include some very important ones like the director of the Comprehensively Deepening Reforms Commission and so 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 the central committee, uh, the central commission responsible for institutional reform is also being overlooked by this in a very centralized structure. And he's also heading the Central Finance and Economic Affairs Commission, so on and so forth. So, yes, despite the extent of the deliberations, there is indeed over centralization of, of, um, of uh, under a unified authority. At the same time, if we look at, and, and yes, uh, this we also see this play out in the appointments that will take place under the two sessions. Yes, uh, they won't be voted upon. There will be a lot of more. Even in Lee Kitang's work report, we see a continuous reiteration and backing for Xi Jinping at the core of economic development, of social policy, of foreign policy, so on and so forth. So, uh, the, his, hang on, hang on. We, 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 we'll get into that meat of things right now. Let's get into Lee Kitang's work, work report. Because I, I think that you know a lot of people in India who tend to follow uh, or who are interested in China or foreign affairs do, maybe don't understand what exactly does it mean when we say Lee Kachang's work report. So let me just give a brief preamble and then I want to hear your thoughts on the work report that you were just talking about. Uh, so firstly, folks, if you're new to understanding China, uh, just something basic. Every year, the premier who is essentially in charge of the state council, which is in charge of the government and the functioning of the government, he or she, it's usually, it's always a he, but could be a she sometimes, uh, but never has been. So he would deliver a annual sort of state of the union address it's it's sort of a combination of two it's sort of the state of the union and for indian listeners it's sort of a budget speech uh, and it's combined together uh, the specifics are not given like the budget speech in the speech but it's a combination of these two where you're outlining the priorities of what you want to achieve in this year and you're outlining some targets and you're also talking about what was achieved this year. So for anybody who's looking at government data and who wants to at least know what the Chinese government is saying that it has achieved economically, listening and reading and watching this speech is uh, important. So with that said, with that preamble, Anushka, what were the key parts of the work report? You started with obviously telling us about how Li Keqiang credited Xi Jinping with being the fundamental reason behind all the success. Uh, but what were the key parts of the report? Right. So I would say that um, the work report um, is uh, even though yes, it uh, does applaud Xi Jinping time and time again. It starts out uh, with saying that it's the central committee that has been at the core of all um, kind of political and economic policy. So I think that would be a good starting point to kind of highlight that the report does really well to not only applaud and thump the Chinese back on kind of all the achievements that it may have and the goals that it has, you know, been successful on in the past few months and years, but also all the negatives that still continue to persist in the Chinese political and socio-economic setup and how they need to be addressed and dealt with. Of course, I a full reading of the report kind of indicates that it it is more in detail about the past of what has already happened, say, under uh, Li Keqiang's uh, five-year tenure and less to do with future policy although Li Keqiang does highlight some targets in his work report for the year to come and I think I'd like to focus more on those than anything else so I think some key points that stand out to me are sort of committed focus to few things like development in science and technology which has again become a very kind of elaborated narrative in among Chinese political elite now because they argue that the West has put their scientific advancement and technological growth on a quote-unquote stranglehold so that that definitely stands out what also stands out is 
a continued support from the party to the public and private sector economies given the intense kind of downfall in market capitalization some of the key and leading sectors of the private economy like the real estate and the tech industries have faced because of the repercussions from the 3 year old uh, zero covid policy and we see a sustained emphasis on growth that is green and sustainable we see that there is a narrative which has been repeated by xi jinping in his speech at the second plenary session of the 20th party congress also and in the work report and the budget which is that the external environment has become increasingly hostile so there has to be kind of a uh, an accommodative approach to both economic and foreign policy and so on that front on the on the domestic economy front especially i think the work report highlights that the target is to maintain an urban unemployment rate of around 5.5% and these these projections are again like i mentioned trying to balance the positive against the negative they're trying to be realistic by aiming for a higher number but um, than as compared to say 2021 when the rate of unemployment was 5.1% but the sta- the figure still remains relatively stable around 5% and lower than what we saw at the peak of unemployment in 2020 which was a 5.6% figure and then he's also said that the aim is to achieve a gdp growth of around 5% and we have already discussed at takshila how various agencies came out with their projections for chinese gdp growth and they were more or less around 5% so again that's realistic and on the private sector front he backed the two unwaverings which is the support for the public and private sector and i think the two unwaverings or the two unswervings as they have been interchangeably called have to be looked at with a pinch of salt so for our listeners they stand for the two goals of the cpc which are to unswervingly consol- uh, consolidate and develop the public sector of the economy and unswervingly encourage and support and guide the development of the non public sector or the private sector of the economy and after these were enunciated in 2020 subsequently the cpc quote and quote guided its private sector economy especially the real estate and platform economy by imposing harsh regulatory compliances to curb excesses and restrict their sprawling financial services and in the process there was a real devastation across the real estate sectors with the evergrande crisis and with a uh, platform economy companies like ant group and dd global also facing quite a chunk of that clamp down and since the cpc has recently announced some economic relief beginning with the scrapping of the zero covid policy the policy narrative has shifted slightly towards infusing uh, liquidity and relaxing restrictions but the continued reiteration of the two unservings including in lee kechang's work report may indicate continued headwinds and regulatory compliances for the private sector and then on the military uh, lee kechang has emphasized combat preparedness and called for the need to open a new chapter of unity between the military and the government and between the military and the people which goes to show that there will be an increasing emphasis on civil military relations and this extensive focus on combat preparedness is increasingly in the works now even the draft central and local budgets for 2023 which we can discuss moving further which were to be presented at the first session of the 14th npc we see a 7.2% increase in the defense budget and the focus again is on modernization equipment procurement and strengthening uh, the armed forces by upskilling personnel with science and technology related training so i think these are some key takeaways for me from the work report and uh, one one another important one which uh, works out on the common prosperity front is uh, an improvement in preferential tax and fee policies and extension and refinement of policies on tax and fee cuts tax rebates and so on and i think I, this does have to, a lot to do with the focus on common prosperity because the primary goal of the pro- common prosperity campaign is to eventually lead to the making of like an all shaped society which is biggest in the center or in the middle income level and an important tool for the cpc to deploy in bringing about such a society is differentiation in taxation so all the policy achievements that lee ke chang's report highlighted and the targets he looks out for in 2023 suggest an upward trend in the number of tax reforms that will be issued under xi jinping with the ultimate goal of 
creating what they call a shared future for mankind so i think yeah it's interesting I, i again i agree with some of the things that you're saying and i don't agree with some of the things that you're saying so i i do acknowledge some of the key points that you've highlighted already let me start from a bit of the bottom at the bottom sort of the last things first so i, I don't see the tax cuts and tax relief and rebates policies linked to common prosperity i, I think those are related to you know it's been policy for the last couple of years since the pandemic started that instead of flooding the system with stimulus uh, they've sort of looked at tax policy fee cuts and things like that to cut the burden on enterprises so that the enterprises can maintain people on payrolls and you don't see large scale unemployment you know and they can also have more liquid capital in hand for other things uh, and that's essentially what uh, the effort in this context of uh, i mean what lika chang is basically saying is that look we are going to be uh, continuing with that policy so far and we are going to in the words of uh, how they how the chinese authorities tend to tend to speak is that we are going to optimize this policy as much as possible uh, because it's essentially needed to be able to uh, support uh, enterprises and to keep people on payrolls uh, so in his work report he talks about the fact that over the past 5 years tax cuts and fee reductions have totaled to around 5.4 trillion yuan uh, and 2.8 trillion yuan so it, it's a continuous policy and the purpose of this is essentially to try and make sure that enterprises remain uh, at least in the green and they can sustain employment it's linked to the employment first policy as opposed to necessarily common prosperity other elements of taxation are linked to common prosperity uh, i do agree uh, some degree of income tax reform some degree of potentially some day somewhere property tax reform you know instruments like you said which can essentially try and balance income distribution and there is some suggestion in this document that they might be trying to do some of these things but the past has shown us that when push comes to shove the party has often wavered on some of these because such degree of redistribution has been challenging and i don't think that we will see it this year in particular i mean i don't see we will see them going hard on redistribution uh, efforts this year because the objective is to stimulate growth and that's going to be the primary goal for the year if you if you're going to hit 5% uh, and probably more again most people suggested that the chinese government could actually set a higher target so the setting of 5% also shows that you don't necessarily just want to open the financial spigots to allow people to just invest in in domains where you think uh that they, that they that they feel that you don't want to prioritize gdp growth as a number because you have these other range of objectives to meet whether it is de-risking in the property market whether it is environment uh and so on and so forth or whether it's sort of education and things like that so so i mean i have a slight difference uh, of uh, opinion on that particular aspect i also think that in the report some of the things that he talked about are important like at, at certain points of time he talked about budgetary imbalances of uh, some local governments and he said and he quite categorically says this the budgetary imbalances of local governments of some local governments are substantial and he talks about the hidden risks in the real estate market that need to be uh, taken into account there's a slew of goals that have been outlined it's interesting that he talks about uh, there are seven priorities that he outlines uh, and it, what's fascinating is that any of these goals that he talks about any of the priorities that he talks about in the report are recommendations as opposed to objectives in that sense which is interesting because li keqiang is retiring and li qiang is expected to take over as premier and be appointed as premier at the end of this week as the two sessions end another sort of uh, some key developments within the report and then let's look at the budget document um, he talks about uh, 3.8 trillion yuan being allocated for special purpose bonds for government this is you know highest higher than uh the last time an increase of about 150 billion rmb um and they're also saying that we will try and expand the areas in which this can be used this is useful to know because uh, these are used essentially for major projects that the government wants to carry out and it supports local governments to extend these it also allows them to prop up investment and gdp through investment by doing this for the last couple of years we've seen lots of advance issue of these bonds before even the year has began so that there can be project capital that keeps going on and they can and again this supports employment this supports big projects and things like that so this is government spending to try and create uh, you know to try and serve some of the priorities that you may have say on technology digital infrastructure uh, water conservation and things like that on a whole host of priority major projects which i think is something worth noting there's a lot of talk in there about technologies and like you said uh, you know core technologies which 
where you need to work on and where you need to focus your efforts on i also thought that his comment about the platform economies and uh, you know uh, and the digital economy is it, is really interesting because it, it doesn't sound like there's going to be an easing and i think a lot of people have gotten trapped in this narrative of there was a crackdown now the crackdown is over you know he specifically says that we should strive to develop the digital economy step up and i quote regular oversight and support the development of the platform economy this regular oversight basically tells you that look there have been systemic changes that have been made in terms of the role of the state administration for market regulation samr for other institutions and there have been legislative changes with regard to say data security with regard to monopolistic practices all of that has changed the system within which these enterprises are operating so you're not going to go back to the days where everything goes back to how it was and there was a brief interlude of a crackdown i think the systemic and env- the environment has changed and so you're going to see that change the last thing that i wanted to sort of talk about on the property sector it's interesting that he sorry before i get to the property sector one more bit on the tech sector is that you know we spoke about this earlier you know like what is the utility of these two sessions if everything is a rubber stamp and we talked about how there is a deliberative element to it it's worth seeing the number of the kind of delegates who are there in these sessions and what sectors do they belong to so more reporting is telling you that areas like semiconductors high end technology people from those domains are part of the deliberations this time around as opposed to people who are from consumer tech uh, so obviously ten cents chief being left out was the big news but increasingly the focus has been on that sort of hard core hard core foundational tech as opposed to consumer tech and that shift is telling Uh, this shift was also telling in last year at the 20th party congress when we saw the composition of the central committee there were more people from this sort of background and even this time around we are seeing that being reflected so it tells you a little bit about which way uh, the tech focus is going to be and the final point like i said on real estate uh, i think this is a real problem for them um, because a lot of it is linked to local government finances and the fundamental weakness of the banking sector which is linked to this real estate economy and dikhe chang i think sort of talks about that he say and he outlines some priorities which we should keep an eye on he talks about the need to ensure effective risk prevention and mitigation for high quality leading real estate enterprises talks about helping them improve their debt to asset ratios and also talks about the need to prevent unregulated expansion in the real estate market which again doesn't tell you that uh, if this is something to go by it it's not clear that again we are going to go back to business and normal Uh, yes the three red lines on the real estate sector which were outlined a couple of years ago those are being eased but it's not business as usual uh, you know there is some sort of holding the line on the reforms that you wanted to carry out to address the moral hazard that leads to real estate market becoming such a problem so it's yeah it's i, I think this is again going to be a challenging balance for the next uh, leadership to take over uh, i have two more sort of questions did you manage to anushka look at the the draft the local and central government budget documents just a tad yes it's quite a long 52 page document but it it has quite a lot to offer yes yeah i want to just put out some of the data in there because i just think this is useful and one of the reasons is that one of the reasons i wanted to put this out is because people don't necessarily read through this cuz and i completely empathize why people don't read through it but i think that some of the data is useful to just capture what's happening in the system and what sort of expenditure you know is going to is being carried out but yeah i want to first toss it up to you anything particularly of note to you in the document right so just to add on to some of the points you made uh, before before i move on to the budget so yes i definitely agree that the stand out uh, sort of policy we expect to see discussed ar- across the two weeks and then in the policy to come would be the scientific advancement and technological self reliance so i think in an analysis neil thomas published for the eurasia group he argued that she has arranged the selection of what might be quote and quote the most educated party central committee ever with politburo members like you mentioned having extensive degrees and experience in heading space agencies scientific research and 
so on. And uh, I think she also laid out in a speech at the second plenary that fiscal investment in basic research should also be steadily increased. Enterprises should be motivated to invest more through measures such as tax incentives, input from social forces, and uh, the nat- the National Natural Science Fund and its joint fund should be improved, which was also again highlighted in the budget. So, yes. And yeah, uh, even in the real estate sector, on the one hand, we see Liu He at Davos or Lee Kechang in his work report talk about helping the sector through infusion of liquidity and quote unquote blood transfusion. But Lee again still went ahead and said that we have to prevent unregulated expansion in the real estate market. And so there will only be as much a focus given to fiscal stimulation as is essential to prevent a collapse, but not so far as to cause excessive growth, which will again invite clamp down on capital excesses, like you mentioned. And my point regarding uh, common prosperity came largely from what the Jajiang government had to say in its implementation plan and work reports on common prosperity, which was that I do agree that it's about employment, but then when they argue that the vitality of market entities has to be stimulated for them to keep people on the payroll, I think it links to common prosperity where how they're stimulating these enterprises is by implementing favorable policies like tax reduction, fee reduction and reducing the burden on them to kind of cultivate and expand uh, market entities. Um with again that dual aim of keeping people on a payroll and having a larger middle income society now on the budget i think what stood out for me that lee lee kichang's report acknowledged that there are uncertainties in the external environment which are on the rise as i mentioned before and global inf- inflation remains high global economic and trade growth is losing steam and external attempts to suppress and contain china are escalating and so this has had impacts on both the foreign policy and the domestic economy and exports have taken a major hit as you know empty container ships are stacking up on ports in Shanghai and Guangdong and in this context China needs not just a sound economic and financial policy but also a moderate foreign policy approach so in this regard the budget offers a uh, 54.836 billion yuan budget on diplomatic endeavors, which is up by 12.2%. And we also see that since Wangi has taken over the post of director of the Central Foreign Affairs Commission, among the 30 meetings and phone calls he has had since his promotion, half were to European counterparts with most taking place during his visits to Italy, Hungary, Brussels and Germany. And the narrative both in the budget and in the aftermath of these trips has been to reset relations and expand on or boost investor confidence so that the domestic economy can be kind of leveraged and the other things that budget the budget also offers a 7.2% increase in defense expenditure which is again interesting considering we talked about combat preparedness and the budget is now now stands at 1.5537 trillion yuan and this allocation is again spread across modernization and upskilling of personnel in the science and technology fields i think the budget also says that it acknowledges that because total expenditure will exceed total revenue, leaving a deficit of around 3.16 trillion yuan, which is 510 billion yuan higher than 2022, it will be supplemented through the issuance of government bonds. And you talked about this. And what I'd like to highlight is that there is some consensus forming among economic analysts that the case for Chinese government bonds has become relatively stronger since 2021, given that China's policy stance has shifted from over tightening to uh, for most of 2021 towards easing in recent months and this was followed by calls to support the real economy and the people's bank of china cut its reserve requirement ratio for banks twice since december of 2021 thrice across 2022 and except in the housing sector for most of 2022 and 2023 inflation has also uh, stayed relatively under control in china so there is no urgency also for banks to tighten policy which is in sharp contrast to other sovereigns like the us the uk where persistent inflationary pressures have forced central banks to pull forward policy normalization. And even though the foreign ownership in the CBG market is uh, relatively lower, the market itself has become third largest in the world. And it has a rare kind of advantage of providing a positive real yield despite great government interventionism in the market. 
and they're also attract these corporate bonds the chinese corporate bonds especially also boast attractive yields and they have wider spreads with lower duration risks than other global credit markets so why this stands out for me in the budget is that if the government can work towards expanding foreign investor ownership of these bonds the government income will likely expand as well yeah i mean I, i'm not certain how much that will expand government income but uh, because i don't think that it's uh, you know you're going to see too much i mean you're going to see investment in certain areas but it's unlikely that you're going to see lots more purchases of uh, you know bond purchases which is going to support the kind of spending but yeah i mean we'll we'll wait and see some of the things that i wanted to highlight in that is just a quick look at sort of uh, expenditure you know budgeted expenditure in different areas so you know for diplomacy there's a uh, the budget annually is up by 12% so about 54 55 billion rmb on national defense like you already said it's 7.2% increase to 1.5 trillion rmb on uh, education also the budget is hiked up by up 2% which is i think really important uh, given that you know in india we've been struggling with this idea of how do you raise the education budget and we are seeing beijing continuing to spend more on education these are the kind of metrics that don't really get talked about and these are important the science tech budget is also up by 2% one interesting figure which i don't think again people will look and because uh, a lot of the talk during the two sessions has been so far about food security and the budget uh, there's a specific budget allocation for stockpiling grain edible oils and materials this is up by about 13 and a half percent to a 132 billion rmb so th- this is really really important that you're seeing these priorities being identified and budgets on those uh, going up it to end with uh, you know i just wanted to sort of talk about briefly because we're already quite out over time after the first day of the two sessions uh, of the after lee kachang's uh, report on sunday uh, you had uh, on monday the people's daily is obviously talked about these but then you had you know an engagement of xi jinping with the jiangsu delegation and he talked about the importance of manufacturing and food security and grains uh, and it's really interesting how he's framed the entire thing uh, in that conversation and you will see this repeated because these are going to be two big priorities and he's essentially talked about the need for self reliance he says that uh, i often say two things must be guaranteed china must secure its rice bowl and secure the manufacturing industry for a country with a population of, of over 1.4 billion we must solve these two problems on our own one cannot and this is a changyu it's a phrase uh, which roughly translated means one cannot make a living everywhere with just one skill without having secured this no international market can protect us so it's really important to see how he's framing and what the world view is despite all the talk about being open and all of that it's it's an insular industrial policy driven world view which i think we should take note beyond what is uh, said on openness and the other interesting thing in the paper that was worth noting which again i think is a theme and we i think we're coming full circle because we began with shijing things authority i recommend people just go and look at how every senior leader of the party and the state has essentially today in the paper and we're recording this on monday has essentially talked about that said that every development every achievement over the past 5 or 10 years has the fundamental reason behind it is xi jinping's leadership so there is this complete nodding of the system or sort of bowing of the system to kiss the ring and it just fascinates me because ever so often we will hear somebody talk about the fact that this man's position is in jeopardy nothing evidenced tells us that that is the case everything evidence today tells us that he is in complete control and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for the system is up for debate uh, you know i i see the many challenges that that brings but the fact that he is completely in control is you know there's more and more evidence that tells you that um, you know so i i think that this is really worth people going in looking at that and like we said in the beginning it's worth following the two sessions because they give you an in- insight into what kind of policy frameworks we're likely to see there's lots more in there uh, about the possibility of a uh, about the changes to the new to the legislation law of china about the changes about possibly new foreign sanctions legislation being deliberated and lots more so i recommend that people stay tuned and hopefully after a week once we have the final readouts from the two sessions we'll try and do another roundup 
to talk about what were the big outcomes uh, and see if we got any other stuff right that we so far been talking about with that i think we can call it today uh, thank you so much anusha thank you thank you for having me this was a pleasure and thank you folks for listening do keep listening to all things policy if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can tune into them on the ivm podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also follow ivm on social media the handle is at ivm podcasts on twitter facebook and instagram And hey if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology strategy and economic affairs check us out at our twitter handle at takshashila inst or our website takshashila.org.in